Good morning, everybody. Welcome back, Corey Hughes Bloody History. I have to apologize. I haven't uh, done a show in like a week. Um, I've just been feeling a little under the weather. So, my apologies. But we're back today. And I know I have another episode of a fucking Armstrong's Ruth Payne file, right? Um, it'll be what, be part eight? And I think uh, that'll wrap it up, but uh, I just don't want to do that today, okay? We're going to get to it eventually, but um, I am finding myself gravitating back towards an area of the assassination that I've spent some time on, but not nearly as much. There's a, th- th- What we're going to talk about today is an, what I'll consider an era of Kennedy research focused around John Armstrong, who, like I've said before, dug up the most incredible data. He's probably one of the best um, purveyors of information in Kennedy ever. But unfortunately, his conclusions are totally wrong. Uh, I kind of understand why he went the direction he did, but he was unable to separate his initial hypotheses about Oswald and a duplicate Oswald from the time that they were like seven or eight years old which appears to be backed up by the documentary record. Um, So what we're going to do today is we're going to begin this journey of examining the work of John Armstrong pretty in depth. We're not going to read the book in in its entirety. Um, it's a little too new for my tastes, and um, and I can pluck uh, some good information from it without having to read you the whole thing. It's a thousand pages long, and everybody needs to read it at some point. But um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read the introduction so you kind of get a basic idea of what his thesis is. And then if you know my work, you'll already see as I'm reading this where he got things wrong. What he didn't get wrong was the data. You can't get data wrong. Data is right unless it's fake, right? And so he dug up all kinds of data on Oswald's background when he was a child, where he went to school, conflicting uh, school records, conflicting uh, employment records. A lot of employment uh, and school records, he believes, was completely uh, either faked and or destroyed by the FBI in their uh, attempt to kind of merge the two lives of these uh, two people into one, right? And so why does John Armstrong believe that there was a duplicate Oswald going back so many years? Well, pff, look at the pictures of Marguerite Oswald, or the woman they tell us is Marguerite Oswald. It's clearly two different women when you look at the photographs of Marguerite Oswald. One of them wears glasses and has a mole on her face. The other one doesn't, right? We have pictures of both of them around 1956 through 65. So that's weird. We have a lot of conflicting images of Oswald, We've got the image of Oswald at the Bronx Zoo that um, John Pick, his half-brother, refused to identify as Oswald, right? So we've got some major um, shenanigans going on, right? Major shenanigans surrounding the life of early Lee Harvey Oswald and whether or not he was part of some intelligence program from the time he was a child. Now, my thesis on this is that, yes, absolutely, I do believe I've I've been going over... um, Armstrong's work long enough to know that I do believe this, that there was a a duplicate Oswald from 47 all the way to 59. And then we start having the duplicate Oswald sightings in New Orleans uh, mentioned by J. Edgar Hoover in June of 1960, right? Um, And then we have like Bolton Ford in in, uh, January 61 when Oswald is still in the Soviet Union, right? But that's a totally different setup. There's totally different... Uh, pairings of, um, of of duplicate Oswalds, right? So basically, uh, Armstrong believed that it was just one duplicate Oswald that was him, with him from his whole life and uh, and set him up uh, in the lead up to the assassination. But he, he, he doesn't include anything about Kerry Thornley or William Seymour. In fact, he only mentions those names one time each in these books. So... He didn't go down that road at all. And if he had, he would have come to understand that every Oswald sighting with a husky Latino was clearly William Seymour and Lawrence Howard, right? He would have come to that conclusion also because he's a smart guy. But he didn't go there for some reason. Um, He didn't look into the alternatives of who was impersonating Oswald other than this duplicate Oswald who he pegged from going back to the time they were children. So um, 
Again, his data is absolutely incredible. His conclusions, I think, are completely flawed and embarrassing almost. The way he phrases some things, completely fraud, completely flawed. Um, without telling the entire story of Armstrong's work, which we'll do over the next week or two, um, we'll do, what we'll do today is we'll just read the introduction to the book so you'll have an idea. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to play some audio clips of interviews uh, with uh, Franchetta Schubert, with Myra DeRus, and with Milton Curian. And those three testimonies will outright contradict the official record and what we know about Oswald's early life. So, all right, introduction. Immediately after President Kennedy's assassination, the FBI began an investigation, even though the Dallas police had sole jurisdiction over the case. Less than an hour after Oswald's arrest, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover wrote a two-page memorandum in which he described Oswald's trips to Russia and Cuba and his involvement with the Fair Play for Cuba committee. Hoover identified Oswald as the prime suspect and knew the building from which the shots were fired all within an hour of Oswald's arrest. Following the assassination, Dallas Police Lieutenant Jack Ravel was walking through the basement of police headquarters when he was approached by FBI agent James Hosty. FBI agent James Hosty. Reville remembered, Mr. Hosty ran over to me and he says, a communist killed President Kennedy. Lee Oswald killed President Kennedy. I said, who's Lee Oswald? Hosty said, he's in our communist file. We knew he was here in Dallas. I asked him why he had not told us this, and to the best of my recollection, he said that he couldn't. Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry soon appeared on a television broadcast and made a statement to the effect that agents of the FBI had prior information and knowledge regarding Oswald. When J. Edgar Hoover learned of Curry's statement, he instructed senior FBI official C.D. Deloach to contact the senior agent in charge of the Dallas office, Gordon Shanklin, and order him to immediately obtain a retraction. Shanklin was told that if he did not obtain a retraction, he would be terminated from the Bureau. Shanklin quickly contacted Curry and obtained a statement that read, From his, Curry's own personal knowledge, the FBI did not have any previous information regarding Lee Harvey Oswald. J. Edgar Hoover desperately tried to keep the public from learning about the FBI's prior knowledge of Oswald and from wondering if the FBI had any connections or contacts with Oswald. But Hoover was in a difficult position. If he admitted the FBI agents had been following Oswald's activities for the past four years, critics would blame the Bureau for not keeping a close watch on Oswald during the president's trip to Dallas. If he denied knowing of Oswald's activities, critics would blame him for not keeping a close eye on the alleged communist defector. Hoover repeatedly lied to the public and insisted the FBI had no prior knowledge of Oswald. But unknown to the public, the FBI had dozens of reports on Oswald dating back to 1959, which Hoover kept secret from the public. These reports included 1. A file on Lee Harvey Oswald, which contained fingerprints, naval intelligence memorandums, State Department dispatches, letters from the Department of State, interviews with Oswald, his mother, wife, relatives, Miss Ruth Payne, uh, field reports setting forth results of his residences and employment, air tells from the CIA regarding his activities in Mexico City, passport office records, etc. Two, photographs of a middle-aged, heavyset man in Mexico City who was in incorrectly identified by the CIA as Lee Harvey Oswald, a tape recording provided by the CIA station in Mexico City of a telephone conversation between a man they identified as Oswald who was speaking in very poor, broken Russian with personnel at the Soviet embassy. Hoover knew neither the photograph nor the tape recording was of Lee Harvey Oswald being held by the Dallas police. Hoover knew within hours of the assassination that someone had impersonated Oswald in Mexico City less than two months before the assassination, and he shared that information with President Lyndon Johnson the day after the assassination during a tape-recorded telephone conversation. All right, let me pause right here and just comment on this. It says, Hoover knew within hours of the assassination that someone had impersonated Oswald in Mexico City less than two months before the assassination, and he shares that information with President Lyndon Johnson. Okay, so he, uh, J. Edgar Hoover knew that the fucking Mexico City trip was bullshit, okay? It was Kerry Thornley the whole time. I don't know why no one else in the world has figured this out yet. Um, but it was definitely not Oswald, right? And, and, and J. Edgar Hoover knew it. Three, a report by New Orleans agent Milton Kack, K-A-A-C-K, dated October 31st, 63, that included information on Oswald's birth records from the New Orleans Department of Vital Statistics. FBI agents were investigating Oswald's background less than three weeks before the assassination. 
for a report from the FBI confidential informant Eugene Claire Davis, who reported contact with a Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans uh, during the weeks immediately preceding the assassination. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. I knew it. Oh my God, I'm patting myself on the back so hard for this. I've never seen this before, and I should have known this, but the man walking around with Oswald on Canal Street handing out the fucking Fair Play for Cuba Committee flyers was clearly Eugene Davis. Clearly Eugene Davis on site alone. And here we have John Armstrong confirming it. Five, an FBI memo dated three days before the assassination sent by the special agent in charge of the New Orleans FBI office to Director Hoover in which Oswald's business address was listed as Texas School Book Depository, 411 Elm Street, Dallas, Texas. Uh, Six, Hoover's file on Oswald contained over 100 FBI reports and news articles from 59 through 63 relating to Lee Harvey Oswald. FBI Director Hoover knew much more about Lee Harvey Oswald's background than he shared with the public on November 22, 1963. The following evening, Hoover told President John- Lyndon Johnson, quote, We have up here the tape recording and the photograph of the man who was at the Soviet embassy using Oswald's name. That picture and tape recording do not correspond to this man's voice nor to his appearance. In other words, it appears there is a second person who was at the Soviet embassy down there. A second person? Both Hoover and Johnson clearly understood the implications of a second Oswald. Proof that someone had impersonated the man accused of assassinating President Kennedy was a vital concern and appointed either a foreign or domestic conspiracy. To Johnson, it didn't matter. A conspiracy of any kind would cause extreme unrest, possible panic among civilian populations, and it was unacceptable. Johnson personally telephoned Captain Will Fritz, chief of the Homicide Bureau of the Dallas Police Department, told Fritz that the man in DPD custody, Oswald, had assassinated the president. The president then directed his aide, Cliff Carter, to telephone Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade in order, and order him not to allege a conspiracy, and also to telephone Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry and order him to turn over all evidence, mostly Oswald's possessions, to the FBI immediately. Chief Curry turned the physical evidence over to the FBI and it was immediately taken to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. FBI agent James Cadigan told the Warren Commission about receiving the evidence. Oswald's personal possessions on November 23rd, the day after the assassination, but when Cadigan's testimony was published in the Warren volumes, reference to November 23rd had been deleted. Neither the FBI nor the Warren Commission wanted the public to know that Oswald's personal possessions, physical evidence, had been secretly taken to Washington, D.C. and quietly returned three days later to the Dallas police. During the three days that Oswald's possessions were in FBI custody, many items of evidence were altered, fabricated, and destroyed. The evidence was then returned to the Dallas police on November 26th and used by the FBI and Warren Commission to help convince the American public that Oswald was the lone assassin. As the physical evidence was undergoing alteration, FBI officials prepared a five-volume report completed within 48 hours of the assassination that named Lee Harvey Oswald as the lone assassin. The report was released several days before the FBI took over the investigation, before they officially received the evidence from the Dallas police before they interviewed the vast majority of witnesses two weeks before the Warren Commission was formed and many months before their investigation was complete. J. Edgar Hoover hoped the FBI's report, which named Oswald as the lone assassin, would appease the public and keep politicians from calling for an independent investigation. But the speed with which Hoover and top FBI officials completed the report clearly shows the Bureau knew a great deal more about Oswald than they were willing to share with the public. From 59 through 63, FBI agents filed over 100 reports relating to Lee Harvey Oswald. In 1963, they closely monitored his activities in Dallas and New Orleans and furnished the CIA with copies of many reports. But following the assassination, J. Edgar Hoover insisted the FBI knew nothing about Oswald. On November 26, the FBI secretly returned the physical evidence, Oswald's possessions, to the Dallas police where it was officially inventoried and photographed. When the Dallas police received the evidence, they were unaware that many of the items had been altered, fabricated, or destroyed. President Johnson soon announced the FBI was in charge of the investigation, and a short time later, Bureau agents arrived at Dallas police headquarters. As television cameras recorded the historic event, FBI agents collected the evidence, loaded it into a car, and drove away. The public was unaware that the FBI had secretly returned the same evidence to the Dallas police earlier that morning. Note, we will see that many of the items returned to the Dallas police by the FBI were, quote, planted among Oswald's possessions in order to help frame him. 100%. The Warren Commission and the FBI. On November 29th, 
President Lyndon Johnson, by executive order 11130, created the Warren Commission to investigate the assassination of President John Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States. By creating the commission, LBJ preempted the independent investigations by Congress, the Secret Service, and the state of Texas that could have conflicted with or exposed the flaws in the FBI's hastily concluded report. The seven members of the Warren Commission who were appointed by Johnson and answered only to him were Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the U.S., for whom the commission was named, Alan Dulles, former director of CIA, who was fired by President Kennedy, John J. McCloy, former U.S. High Commissioner for Germany and Assistant Secretary of War during World War II. Gerald Ford, Republican U.S. Representative from Michigan, Vice President under Nixon, 38th President. Hale Boggs, Republican U.S. Representative from Louisiana. Richard B. Russell, Democratic Senator from Georgia. John Sherman Cooper, Republican Senator from Kentucky. When the commission held its first meeting on December 5, 1963, Alan Dulles handed copies of a book to each member that claimed assassinations of U.S. presidents were always carried out by deranged lone killers. Throughout the investigation, Dulles and fellow commissioner Gerald Ford insisted that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, assassinated President Kennedy. The commission eventually agreed and concluded that Oswald killed JFK, even though some members disagreed. When the commission began requesting information from the CIA, it was former CIA director Alan Dulles who decided which documents would be seen by fellow commission members. Dulles' appointment to the Warren Commission and his subsequent actions as a commission member strongly suggested that his appointment was for the purpose of protecting CIA interests and secrets. Dulles was so successful that there was no reference to the CIA Central Intelligence Agency in the index to the Warren Commission's 26 volumes. Note, Dulles' suggestion that JFK was yet another U.S. president killed by a lone assassin may or may not have influenced commission members, but Dulles attended more commission meetings than any other member, and he managed to keep the CIA's darkest secrets from the commission. He continuously denied that Oswald was an agent or employee of the CIA, and along with other commission members concluded that Oswald had acted alone. The commission was given subpoena power that allowed them to obtain evidence and testimony in any matter relating to their investigation. The public was told and believed that the commission's blue ribbon panel would conduct a thorough and independent investigation. What the public didn't realize in late 63 was that the FBI had already completed a report on the assassination even before the Warren Commission was created. Their five-volume report named Lee Harvey Oswald as a lone assassin and FBI Director Hoover was determined that neither the commission nor anyone else was going to challenge their conclusion. He wanted the FBI report to be the final word on the assassination without any outside interference. The report was given to the commission on December 9, 1963, only four days after their first meeting. Hoover was annoyed by the Warren Commission and saw no need for their investigation. William Sullivan, the number five man in the FBI, said Hoover did not like to see the Warren Commission come into existence. He showed a marked interest in limiting the scope of it and taking any action which might result in neutralizing it. Hoover wanted to maintain complete control of the investigation, and the Warren Commission represented a potential threat, either real or imagined. At first, Hoover was concerned that a thorough investigation might uncover evidence which would conflict with the Bureau's report. But this problem was solved when FBI field reports, interviews, and evidence were sent to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. before they were turned over to the Warren Commission. FBI officials had an opportunity to screen, select, and approve all items before they were passed on to the commission. FBI official William Sullivan explained, if there were documents that possibly he, Hoover, didn't want to come to light of the public, then those documents no longer exist and the truth will never be known. When FBI officials were presented with interviews of witnesses that conflicted with the FBI's completed report or hinted of a conspiracy, many of those interviews were either suppressed, altered, or destroyed. When the Bureau was presented with physical evidence that conflicted with their report or threatened to connect Oswald with U.S. intelligence agencies, then that evidence was either suppressed, altered, or destroyed. When physical evidence was needed to show a link between Oswald and Cuba, or Oswald and the assassination, then items of evidence were often created. FBI official William Sullivan explained when an enormous organization like the FBI with tremendous power still can sit back and shuffle the deck of cards and pick up the card they want to show you. It may be you're not getting the entire picture. It is not surprising that the majority of reports and items of evidence the FBI provided to the Warren Commission supported their report. Hoover was able to control the outcome of the commission's investigation by carefully choosing the evidence he gave to them. The Warren Commission, for its part, carefully chose witnesses and evidence that supported the FBI's report that named Oswald as the lone assassin. The commission agreed to accept FBI photographs of evidence in lieu of original evidence. 
they accepted photographs of documents in lieu of original documents. They allowed the FBI agents and officials to review and change their testimony prior to publication in the Warren Commission's 26 volumes. Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the United States, instructed court reporters to destroy portions of witness testimony in the presence of commission members. Commission attorneys often lead, coerced, and manipulated witness testimony without objection from commission members. When the commission was confronted with evidence that did not support their conclusion that Oswald had acted alone, then that evidence was often ignored or suppressed. When the commission was confronted with evidence that Oswald was in two different countries, uh, cities, or places at the same time, then that evidence was also ignored or suppressed. But how was the commission able to distinguish between sensitive and non-sensitive information? Who among commission members had even enough knowledge about events leading up to JFK's murder to know which evidence to suppress? Probably the member who attended the most meetings and had vested interest in concealing Oswald's connections to U.S. intelligence, former CIA Director Alan Dulles. Clearly, the FBI and Warren Commission conducted a one-sided investigation. Their sole objective was to identify and limit the scope of the testimony and evidence in order to show that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, killed President Kennedy and Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett. The purpose of this book is to present evidence that has been previously overlooked, misunderstood, ignored, suppressed, or altered that provides a clear picture of what the Warren Commission, FBI, and other government agencies hid from the public for nearly 40 years. In this book, I will present evidence that shows, one, the FBI was monitoring Lee Harvey Oswald for four years prior to the assassination. Two, the FBI was closely monitoring Oswald's activities during the year preceding the assassination. Three, the FBI secretly took the physical evidence gathered by Dallas police to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. on November 23rd. Four, how and why some of that evidence was altered, fabricated, and or destroyed while in FBI custody. Five, key pieces of evidence proving Oswald's, uh, Oswald guilty was planted uh, by the FBI in custody, while in FBI custody. The sixth, the FBI secretly returned the physical evidence to the Dallas police on November 26th. Seven, evidence collected by the FBI disappeared while in FBI custody. Eight, FBI interviews of witnesses disappeared. Nine, statements of witnesses interviewed by FBI agents were changed without their knowledge. Ten, the FBI carefully identified and selected the documents and evidence that were given to the commission. Eleven, the Warren Commission testimony of FBI experts was changed prior to being published in the Warren volumes. Twelve, Chief Justice Earl Warren ordered the destruction of portions of witness testimony in his presence. Thirteen, the FBI systematically collected, suppressed, and destroyed Oswald's original school and employment records. Fourteen, key witnesses who knew Lee Harvey Oswald, in quotes, were ignored and not interviewed by the Warren Commission. Fifteen, attorneys for the Warren Commission failed to properly question witnesses about their knowledge of Oswald. Sixteen, uh, the majority of people associated with Oswald, including co-workers in the private sector, were connected to U.S. intelligence agencies. The Lee Harvey Oswald presented by the Warren Commission was a fic fictional person created by merging the backgrounds of two people, Harvey Oswald and Lee Oswald, from 1952 through November 22, 1963. That's where he got some stuff wrong, but we'll get, we'll get into that. Two young boys, Lee Harvey Oswald and an Eastern European refugee who spoke Russian, was given the name Harvey Oswald, were selected by the CIA for inclusion in a super-secret project known as MK Ultra. The plan was to merge the identity of a Russian-speaking refugee with that of an American-born Lee Harvey Oswald over a period of many years. If the merging of identities was successful, the CIA could then place a native Russian-speaking young man with an American identity in the Soviet Union as a spy. The young man, then known to the world as Lee Harvey Oswald, successfully defected to the Soviet Union in 1959 and returned to the United States with a Russian wife in 1962. A year and a half later, this young man was set up as the patsy in an elaborate scheme engineered by career CIA officials to assassinate President John F. Kennedy. Following the assassination, the FBI and Warren Commission collected and pieced together background information from the Russian-speaking refugee and American-born Lee Harvey Oswald that was used to create a fictional person we know as Lee Harvey Oswald. Two days after the assassination of President Kennedy, the Russian-speaking refugee Harvey Oswald was shot and killed by Dallas nightclub owner CIA gunrunner Jack Ruby. And American-born Lee Oswald was and may still be very much alive. So... There's a lot to digest here when it comes to this Dubogat Oswald stuff, right? But again, let me harp on this. Regardless of how ridiculous it sounds, the CIA counts on you thinking that it's ridiculous and that they would never do it. 
That's why they do things the way they do. That's why there's a thing called tradecraft or spycraft. The CIA most certainly involved uh, the use of body doubles over time, unquestionably. Uh, it's even been mentioned in some of this Kennedy literature that the CIA had been able to create doubles that were so good that even mothers were fooled, which is pretty fucking amazing if you ask me. So the problem, again, with um, Armstrong's work is that he was he failed to differentiate the impersonations of Oswald pre-59 um, and post June 60, right? So that's where he kind of fucked up, um, which we'll get into over time. But um, today, let's continue on. We're going to go ahead and uh, now I'm going to play uh, some interviews for you, okay? Uh, let me think. The first one, and I'll preface this really quickly. So in the 53-54 school year, Oswald is alleged to have been at Beauregard Junior High in New Orleans. This is attested to by Myra DeRoos. Uh, Myra DeRoos was, I think, a, a guidance counselor there, or she was an employee of the school, and she knew a boy there who went to school there who went by the name of Harvey Oswald. And honestly, I kind of thought John Armstrong's work was most, mostly kind of uh, far-fetched, uh, kind of extremist, kind of he didn't kind of get it and but then when I watched the interview with, with Myra DeRoos, it kind of it kind of hit me that what he was saying had some truth to it, right? So that's where we are today. We're going to try to determine how much truth there is behind all this stuff. Not that I think he's, um, not that I think his data is bad, but I think his conclusions were bad. So um, here we go. We're going to play the first interview. This is from Myra DeRoos, and she um, she knew Lee Harvey Oswald starting at the beginning of the school year in September of 1953, if I'm not mistaken. Well, they'll mention the dates um, in these interviews, but I believe it was the 53-54 uh, school year, right? And so remember, he's supposed to have only gone to Beauregard. There's nowhere in his official record whatsoever, anywhere, that he went anywhere else. But we have, and we'll, find, we'll show through these interviews, that he was actually at Stripling in Fort Worth for the first six weeks, um, which overlaps with the time that he was actually at Beauregard, which you'll see because Myra DeRoos says that she first met him in September of 1953, which is which means that he was there for the whole school year, right? So, all right, here we go. Uh, interview with Myra DeRoos. Any time. My name is Myra DeRoos LaRue, and I began teaching school in Orleans Parish in 1953, September. And my school that I was assigned to was Beauregard Junior High School, which is located on Canal Street. I was a physical education teacher. My second year there, I was given a home run. And I held my roll call either in the cafeteria or on the stage in the basement. Sometime after Christmas, I got a new student. It turned out that his name was Lee Harvey Oswald. I never called him Lee Harvey Oswald because he asked me not to call him Lee. And I asked him what he'd like to be called, and he said Harvey. So I've known him as Harvey Oswald. My um, contact with him was just in a homeroom roll call because I only taught girls physical education. But some, sometime, how it happened, I don't know, he and I became friends. And each afternoon, as I did my coaching after school, he would always seem to be in the yard, sitting around, or many times Ed Vogel would come over, and Ed lived only a couple of blocks from school. And he would come over, and that is about the only person that I really saw Harvey uh, socializing with in the time that I knew him. On one occasion, when we were practicing basketball in the schoolyard, Ed Vogel runs out the yard and says, Mr. Roos, Mr. Roos, come inside quick, come inside quick. So Dorothy Duvick, the other PE teacher, and I went into 
basement, and there on the floor was Harvey with an upright piano that had fallen. And uh, he was about his legs, from about the waist down, was under the piano. So Dorothy Kubik and I, with the help of Ed, pulled the piano up, and I asked him if he was hurt. He said he uh, asked Harvey if he was hurt. He said, well, he didn't think so. so. I said, well, maybe we should call your mother. And he says, no, Miss uh, she's at work. Well, you know, this happened at school, and you can't be too careful. So I called our principal, Mr. McMurder, and asked him what I should do. And he said, well, Myra, take him down to Mona Leopard, because that's where we always take the kids when they get hurt or they get sick. Well, Mona Leopard Clinic is about a mile east of the school on Canal Street. So we got in the car, and I drove Harvey down, and they examined him, and they said he was fine. And it was getting dark, and it was a little after five. So I didn't want him going home by himself, so I asked him where he lived. He said he lived on Exchange Alley down near the river. So I drove him down, and it was really a kind of disgusting place. And I was awfully glad I didn't live there. And he lived upstairs over uh, a bar room. And that was one the only time that I ever took uh, came home. Then later in the year, I was outside in the backyard. We were practicing softball. And I looked up, and here's a fight going on on the schoolyard. Now, our schoolyard, the back, is solid concrete. So I stopped the practice, and I go over to see about the fight, and there's Harvey down the bottom with about three boys just kicking him and beating him. Well, I didn't really have to do much to them because I didn't. I had the reputation of being a disciplinarian and kind of rough anyway. So I really don't even remember who the boys were that were doing the fighting. But he was bloody pretty good, so I brought him in the PE office and washed off his little scrapes and <laughs> put on his band-aids. Was this on the back side of the school or the front side of the school? On the side of the school. Side of the school, east or west? East, east the west side. West close side. Close to the lake. Close to, to the lake. And another thing about Harvey, we had to be, I had to be to school at 8 o'clock, and Harvey was always at school when I got there waiting for the door to open at 8 o'clock because the students could go into the library. And Harvey was always there, and he went to the library every day. Then in the afternoon, the library was open until 4 o'clock. We was out at 3.15. And that's where Harvey would go to the library to 4 o'clock, and when Miss Smith closed the library, then he would come downstairs, always carrying books, uh, to me, this is my opinion. Harvey was a very quiet child. He did not have any friends. Ed Vogel, as I said, was the only friend that I knew him to have. He was a scrawny child. He seemed to be out of place with his other students. Uh, Bury guard geographical district took in the lakefront and most of the students were middle class or above means. They dressed better than he did. They had more money than he did. They had more clothes than he did and he just did not seem to fit in with the kids. They didn't accept him or he didn't accept them. I don't know but he really was not a part of the student body. He was, he was a, 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 a loner. Whether I don't think it was by choice, the rest of the kids just didn't accept him. And he was a lonely kid. And that's really the reason why he was at school every day, was he was lonely and he really didn't have a great place to go home to. So I just put off going home as long as he could.
How, how do you do academically? Well, he's got all of his reports. Yes. I've got them, but I could put my hands on them at this moment because he sent them to me. <laughs> but he, he seemed to be an average student, if I remember. His attendance was good. He didn't have poor attendance. He had good attendance. Remember seeing him in the halls walking around? No, because there wasn't anything down. I was downstairs all the time. I see. And you see the classrooms on the second, third floor. And only downstairs was that basement cafeteria and the boys and girls dressing room for physical education. So I was never up on the second and third floor. Except to go to in the morning, I had to go up the steps, go in the front door, and you have to sign in at the office. When did you have your homeroom? What year? Uh, 54. September 54. That's the only time you had a homeroom? No, it's 53, 54. Yep. Yeah. Only one. You worked at Beauregard, out at Beauregard for three years? Three years. And in the middle year, the second year you were there, you had the homeroom. Mm-hmm. And he was in your homeroom class? Yes. So you never did get to meet his mother? The only time he had, the only discussion of any relative was when uh, that day the piano fell. And I said, uh, we need to go in the office and call your mother. And he said, she's at work. So she never showed up for a parent-teacher's meeting? Or no, no. He never talked about himself? Mm-mm. See, I told you, he, 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 they couldn't have been in New York alone because his... You know, if you're a teacher and you're really a teacher, you're very observant. You're a very, you've got to be a teacher. You've got to be very observant. His, uh, he, had, he, he talked just like all the rest of the kids in school. So he couldn't have been in New York long enough to pick up any kind of accent. So the <clears throat> main takeaways from... Uh, and this is only the the first third, I believe, of her interview. I think she did about a half hour. Um, they're all available on YouTube, but all of the interviews um, I compiled, and they're on this podcast stream somewhere. If you scroll back through it, uh, you'll find it. Um, they're definitely they're, they're they're crucial in understanding at least this aspect of the Kennedy assassination. But what do we derive from what she says? That. We can say with certainty that Oswald was there from the beginning of the school year, starting in 1953, and that his main friend was uh, Ed Vobel, right? Vobel, I believe, has connections to the uh, Civil Air Patrol. Um, and what else is there? The incident with the piano. I believe this is the incident where he had a tooth knocked out, maybe? I'm not sure. But... Um, you can tell that there's clear evidence and we have the documentation of the school records and all that stuff that show that Oswald was at Beauregard in New Orleans starting at the beginning of school year of 1953. So now what I want to do is I'm going to play a short interview from Franchetta Schubert, who is a who was a student at uh, Stripling Junior High in Fort Worth. Stripling Junior High was right next to the uh, Thomas Place address that Marguerite Oswald was allegedly living at um, when the assassination happened. But Franchetta Schubert um, is a is a really good witness, someone who actually saw Oswald at Stripling and could identify him clearly. So here we go. Here's a, a short interview with Franchetta Schubert. I'm Zeta Schubert, and I used to go to Stripling junior high uh, during the 53-54 school year as a seventh grader and as an eighth grader we would stand outside at lunch waiting for the school bell to ring so we would attend classes and then as the a seventh grader or eighth grader? eighth grader as an eighth grader would be during the 54-55 school year right and uh, we would see Lee Harvey Oswald and a bunch of his friends going across the playground uh, going home for lunch 
And that's how I remember seeing him in the school. Where exactly did he live? He lived in this, where this brown house now stands. It was a, a wood house with a large front porch. Now you were in the 5354 school year, you were a 7th grader. 7th grader, right. And you saw him in the 7th grade or the 8th grade? 8th grade. Sure would have been 8th grade. grade. Would have been 8th grade. All right, so that would have been the next year? It would have been the next 54, year. 5455 school 54, 55, right. All right. Were you in any classes with him? No. I just see him in the hall, walking around. So I knew who he was from being... Tated because they were going to flush, and I wasn't. Uh, what was his personality like? He, uh, he's kind of a cocky little character. The way he, he's kind of the way he walked, you know, his body language. And uh, he uh, ran with uh, the boys who wore the, the black leather boots and the, and the black leather jackets. But his wasn't black. His was brown. He had the brown boots and the dark brown jackets. His own brand. His own, his own thing. <laughs> All right. Now the um, the years, the timing, the time when you saw him again. That was the fifty. Which one? Fifty-four. Fred Seta entered the school in 1953 as a seventh grader, which right. would be 53, 54 school year. And she, you remember, it was the winter, the summer. It would have been the the cold months. Been when I when I remember seeing him. Would have been in the January, December, January months because they oh, had the jacket on. for a short period of time. Right, right. That I even remember him. He was kind of a nondescript little character, and you'd easily forget if you didn't see him. Had you ever spoken with him? Or? No, never. I never had any classes with him. Did he have many friends? Uh, just the boys who went home to lunch with him. I would presume. Would have been his friends. How about his mother? Did you ever see his mother? Never saw his mother. I knew that she was a widow at the time and that Lee lived with her. And uh, that was all I knew. She worked possibly as a LVN or or uh, took care of sick people at the time. And the, um, the girl who told me that uh, wasn't quite sure. So that's about all I knew about his mother. Anything else? Mm. Gosh, friend. <laughs> okay, so interesting stuff from Sh- Franchetta Schubert. She puts him at, st- at Stripling, right? So even if there was um, some ambiguity over the dates, because it appears as though she saw him um, well, as we'll see from the interview with Frank Kudlady, which I'm about to play, um, he shows records that Oswald was there for at least the first portion of the school year, right? She sees him there in like when it's winter out. So if the school year started in September of 53, she's seeing him around December, January. He was there for more than the first uh, six week period. But Kudlady, as we're about to show, he has the records of Lee Harvey Oswald from Stripling, which, remember, the official story says he never went to Stripling. The official story says he went to Beauregard, not Stripling, ever. He's never alleged in the official story to have gone to Stripling. But here's the interview with Frank Kudlady, which will completely trash that idea. On a Saturday morning following the Kennedy assassination, I received a call at home. Uh, I lived at 4225 Curzon at that time uh, from Mr. Wiley, who was my principal, telling me to go to school and to go to the records file and to get Lee Harvey Oswald's records and that uh, someone from the FBI would be there to pick them up. Uh, That's exactly what I did. Uh, I went to school. I uh, went to the records files got his records out. I did open them. I did look at them uh, kind of in a cursory way. Uh, And and the only thing I can recall is that 
The records for Stripling were in that he didn't attend there a full year. Uh, I put it back in a brown envelope and uh, left it on my desk and waited, oh, 10, 15 minutes or, or perhaps longer. And two gentlemen came in, uh, showed me identification that they were FBI agents. Uh, I gave them the records, and, and the best I remember, one of them did open the envelope and kind of looked at it. And they thanked me, and they left. And I locked the doors, and I went home. And that's about all I, I know about Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. Um, okay. Go on. Oh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, You had mentioned last night about um, the the procedures of, of elementary school records. Yeah. Right. Um, the the records that, that I turned over to the to the FBI may uh, have contained the elementary school records that, that you have in your files because it was it was a, the the procedure that when a student moved from the elementary level to the junior high level a copy of their records were forwarded to show that they had successfully completed the sixth grade um, and as I said last night. Um, how did that? How did that, all the records in the elementary school show up, and there none from the junior high school? And that's a, I think that would be an interesting uh, path to, to go down to see how those records got into the files and where they came from. Did someone go to the elementary school or get them? Now, just just to clarify, we are we are we are talking about the records of Lee Harvey Oswald, the the accused assassin of President. Kennedy. That's right. Mm-hmm. And to your knowledge, he did attend uh, Stripling yes, High School. Yes, he had to attend. Uh, I don't, didn't know Lee Harvey Oswald. I, I didn't know he was a student there. But we wouldn't have had a copy of, some, of records for them had he not attended at least, um, you know, even one day uh, we, would, we would have had a record. And as I said before, the best of my knowledge, the best of my recollection, his records were incomplete in that they did not show a full year of attendance. How many FBI agents uh, came to the school? Two. Mm-hmm. And you can't identify that? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> when you looked at the records, did you by chance notice that he had had grade marks, not, not necessarily what the grade marks were, but grade marks to indicate that he'd been there um, a six-week period in order to receive grades? or? You know, that's, I, I, I believe that, that he had grades for one six-week period. That's the best I can remember, but that, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to swear to that. And the time period of his, uh, of his attendance in the school, uh, which which school year was it or which semester was it? Again, the, trying to recall from looking at that record, it would have been in the fall semester. Um, I, I don't. I can't answer that. I don't know. Why do you say the fall semester? Because the best I remember, the report card would start start on the left hand side with courses, and the grades went first six weeks was in the first column, and I remember that that seemed like to, I remember that column was complete, and there was nothing else beyond that. That column was complete, yeah. saying that he received grades for the first six weeks. For six weeks. And John, the the year that that. Uh he would, he would have been um, he would have been a, a, a sophomore. No, see, we only went through the ninth grade, which is seventh, eighth, and ninth. Seventh, eighth, and ninth so grade. Would have been a senior. Uh, yes, if that well, not necessarily. All the report cards were exactly alike. Uh, I mean, he could have been in the seventh, eighth, or ninth, grade. eighth or ninth grade. Right. And, it, and, and if it came to if it came to stripling from uh, from Ridgely West Elementary, the first entrance would have been as a as a seventh grader. But uh, after my discussion with you all last night, there's some uh, really confusion as to where he did go in the seventh grade. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wish I could wish I could think of someone that... that, that uh, Frank, is it, um, not to put words in your mouth, but is it possible that he could have attended um, a second six-week period or a third six-week period, or you, are you reasonably sure it was just one six-week period? Oh, he, he could have attended, um, uh, say, even as much as three weeks into six weeks, 
and not received any the grades wouldn't have gone on the permanent record. They would have been grades in progress that were sent to the school to which we were asked to send records. I see. And the FBI didn't ask for those. They just asked for the permanent records. Yes, uh-huh. And, and, and that would have all been contained in the same package. What is in one of those packages? Uh, generally, it's the it's the uh, uh, the record uh, of the student up to the time we get them, and then uh, we got them, and then uh, their record. Uh, if you attend a Stripling Junior High School seventh, eighth, and ninth, there was a copy of your report card in that in that record. Now, uh, I also uh, my wife mentioned something last night that there's a there's a possibility that there was a cumulative folder. Uh, counselors generally kept a cumulative folder on students, uh, which would have indicated their their grades, their uh, uh, any, any any testing that might have been done, uh, and uh, any any testing records that, that we would have had. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't know whether those those records were ever uh, kept or, or uh, had were they microfished. I don't I don't remember. What about health records? Was health records, the health records were generally contained in the same packet that, that we had. Uh, that that has a vaccination record. Um, they show that, that the, uh, the student had been vaccinated. Uh, Was it the same records from one student to another? In other words, they contain all the similar items, the right. health, mm -hmm. health and the cumulative records and so on. Would there be report cards in there? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, in the, in the counselor's records, or in the in the main office? In the brown envelope you were speaking of. Oh, uh, yes, that, that was in the case was in the most important thing in there. It was grade cards. So, would there have been grade cards for grades, um, perhaps four, five, and six, when he attended Ridgely West Elementary School? There might have been a, a, a copy of them. But more than likely, there would have been a copy of the sixth grade report card in there. Just out of curiosity, in the early 50s, they didn't have copy machines yet, did they? No, we used those old purple mimeograph, mimeograph machines. machines. And were those acceptable to copy <coughs> cards? Could you copy cards by using no, them? No, uh, no. So then what? You have to hand, hand copy a, a report card. Hand copy a report Okay, so copies, yeah. hand copies of report cards right. would be in there. Uh, if, uh, uh, if, you, if the student left Stripling Junior High School, when they left, they checked out of school. Mm -hmm. We would we would give them uh, a copy of the report card and a checkout sheet showing that they had uh, had legally withdrawn from Stripling and were eligible to attend another school. Now, the fact that you still had Lee Oswald's packet envelope, mm -hmm. what would that indicate as far as uh, the subsequent school that he would have attended after Stripling? Nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Because we would, we would have sent a copy to that school. Would there have been a notice in that brown envelope indicating which school would have requested? There might have been, but I really don't recall. Well, I'm not asking you to remember it. <laughs> There's a. Um, would it be a normal thing to do? Normal thing to have in the file. Let's see. It's sent to. Well, I, I would say yes. I don't recall the procedure, but I would say that we would we would we were would have kept a, a good record of what what we did with students. You had related to us last night, Frank, that the um, that there was a directive given to the children to to the other students about. Or well, not a directive. We. So I think that Frank Kudlady's testimony or his interview for John Armstrong, that is as convincing as it gets. And it completely backs up the the story by Franchetta Schubert, right? Because he confirmed it was the fall semester. She said she saw him wearing, wearing jackets because it was cold. So I don't think there's much question left. He absolutely attended Stripling during the 1953-1954 school year. And according to Kudlady, um, he had attended at least the first six weeks. But if you take into consideration Franchetta Schubert's statement, he, she, he, she believed he was there in December, January, which is well beyond the first six weeks of the school year, right? So some shenanigans there. But hearken back to Myra DeRoos or Myra DeRoos LaRue. 
she um, clearly said that she met Lee Harvey Oswald in September of 1953. Right? So we have an unquestionable contradiction here. It appears that there were two Lee Harvey Oswalds and that one was going to Stripling and one was going to Beauregard during this like minimum six week overlap period. What are we to make of this? This is the biggest question left unsolved in in Kennedy, as far as I'm concerned. But that's going to do it for me today, guys. We're going to wrap this thing up and um, we'll be back tomorrow and we will continue with the work of John Armstrong. We're not going to read the book uh, word for word, but we're going to go through sections of it and we're going to go through a lot of his documents. I got 100,000 pages of, of John Armstrong documents. I think tomorrow we'll start with some of the duplicate Oswald documents that he has. So... That's going to do it for me, guys. Um, I got a stack of books here, and you can get a free signed copy of my book, absolutely free. All you have to do is sign up for my Substack, Bloody History World War II. It's 50, if you pay 50 bucks for the year, I will send you a copy of my book for free, signed. Okay, I sell those for 50 bucks normally, but you'll get it for free if you sign up at my Substack. And that's all the marketing I'm going to do today because I fucking hate it. So, um, All right, guys, we'll be back tomorrow where we will continue on John Armstrong. Thank you.